Welcome. I invite you all to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, D, if you'd take the roll. Director Stewart. Present. Director Nicholson. Present. Director Epen. Present. Director Wallace. Present. Director Danielson. Thank you, Dee. We're, we're ready now for an education session. In November 2004, the Washington Township Healthcare District voters approved Bond Measure FF, which authorized the improvement and expansion of the Washington Hospital Facilities Master Plan. Uh, we'll call that Phase 1 of the Master Plan. In November 12th, voters approved Bond Measure Z, which the voters of our community approved for the build-out of the Washington Hospital Master Plan, including our last project, the Morris Hyman Critical Care Pavilion. We're going to hear tonight from Mr. Jack Walsh, uh, who is chairman of the Bond Oversight Committee and has been on the Bond Oversight Committee since its inception in 2005. Mr. Walsh is the founder and president of Walsh Enterprises, a family-owned company in Hayward, California. Walsh Enterprises has evolved into a full-service, vertically integrated builder developers specializing in the development and construction of concrete built-up buildings. The company has been listed as one of the largest developers and property managers in the Bay Area. Um, as I say, Mr. Balsh is chairman. He serves with four other members. Mr. Al Huezo, a member since 2006. Kevin Hom, a member since 2010. Mr. Craig Steckler, a member since 2015. And Mr. Jack Rogers, a member since 2017. Mr. Walsh is with us tonight to give us the annual report, annual report from the Bond Oversight Committee for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2018. First thing to know is we came in on budget, or some might even say, say slightly under budget. Bottom line. The thing that you probably don't know is how difficult it was to do that. And it had nothing to do with the oversight committee. But this stuff was estimated a long time ago. We saw major escalations in construction costs. And doing the contractors you picked, the way you picked it for design build, I think was a major contributing factor to staying on budget, along with Mr. Dan and his crew, Chris Hendry. Wise, wisely investing our money, getting the biggest return, the best return on that. And there was a gentleman named Bob Grossi, who was with their construction management, who oversaw the change orders and made sure that only the reasonable change orders were approved. So the long and the short, I think there's a lot of people that did an excellent job and you have a lot to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. It is very, very nice to have that committee. Happen. You're welcome. Incredibly nice to have that building finished on time, on budget. I think from now on we'll say on time, slightly under. <laughs> you were elected, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it really is a wonderful thing. It really, really is a wonderful thing to have that building completed and on schedule. Patience, love. So uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. I appreciate everyone that did any part of that. It's been a very, very wonderful thing. We'll now uh, have a report on the Philippine medical mission. I'd like to Carmen. That's fine. That's all right. I think mm -hmm. most all of us know Dr. Carmen Ogbuli. She's the director of our intensivist program at our intensive care unit here at Washington Hospital. And she's held that position since 2008. She graduated from the University of the Philippines and the University of the East Memorial Medical Center. She completed her internal medicine residency at St. Barnabas Hospital 
in New York City, which is an affiliate of Cornell Medical Center. She did her fellowship in pulmonary critical care at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles County Hospital. She also worked as a clinical specialist at the LA County Tuberculosis Clinic, as well as an urgent care physician at Claude Hudson Clinic from 1988 to 1991. <clears throat> Dr. Aquili is board certified in internal medicine and critical care. She's also a fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians and a member of the Society of Critical Care. She started her private practice in Fremont right after her fellowship in 1991. She's also presently the medical director of our critical care units and intermediate care unit and the medical director of the Ohlone Respiratory Care Department since 2010. Thank you, Carmen. Yes. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. I've been uh, in Washington Hospital or in Fremont for, since 1991. So that's 28 years of practice and being, feeling like this is Washington Hospital family. So before I start, I, uh, I would like to share with you, as, as Nancy said, in our experience in volunteering in a medical mission. There were eight of us from Washington Hospital that went and uh, volunteered their time and travel expenses. I'd like to thank Washington Hospital, Nancy Farber, and the Washington Hospital family for all your generosity. The abundant donations that you've given really helped this team or the medical society uh, give the proper medical and surgical services and the proper care for this patient. So let's start our journey. We went to the Philippines in the Northern part, this is Candon, Ilocosur. So after a 13 hour air flight from San Francisco to Manila International Airport, this is this one, then we have a 10 hour bus ride to go to that destination. So we arrived there at 5 o'clock p.m. January 19. So we lost a day. We left here January 17, we arrived January 19. So we just rested and the following day we have to go to our assignments set up supplies and everything. So that Monday, these are the 170 mission volunteers. We congregated at seven o'clock in the auditorium and um, did our little prayer and reminded them of their code of conduct, that we are mission missionaries and volunteers. So we need to uh, tone down our expectation, but not our standards. So that's where we started. And the outpatient, they start at they start at around eight o'clock. Surgery start at around seven o'clock. So they were a little bit late for the first day. These are the patients that are already waiting to be triaged. And our triage services consisted of the local local volunteers, our nurses, and some interpreters. Around I think ten tables, and we increased to twenty tables later on because of the huge amount of people that came. So in the outpatient department, we have the optometry service. We were lucky to have three volunteer optometrists, and we distributed, took all their equipments and tools with them, and we distributed around 2,167 glasses. Not just reading glasses, but things that they can see, far vision and all those things. So that's an error, it's not just reading glasses. Then we have our dental services. We have only two dental volunteers, but we were able to have 491 extraction, and as you can see, uh, I'd like to point, they, they, we don't have dental chairs. <laughs> These are our chairs oh um, together, and so we have an array of five maybe, and then we put some lidocaine, nodding medicine, one by one, and then wait for five, 10 minutes, and then extract one by one. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how it is, no privacy. And if you're a little bit anxious, you can have uh, a bed, a small bench where you can lie down here. And we have the, uh, this is a pre-medical student. We have 20 of them uh, volunteering and he, he, she is providing the light. This is, this is her and these are two cheerleaders here for this patient. The pediatric services are always a happy service. 
because they we bring stuffed toys, um, you know, chocolates and all those kinds of deal for the kids. We have six uh, pediatricians and we, they saw 682 pediatric patients in a week, five days. The medical services, there were 12 uh, doctors all in all, family uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, and internists. And they saw 2,243 patients. This is my husband, Arnold, who's interpreting. He's from that part of town, so he knows the dialect. Our newest part of the team are the rehab team. We have one chiropractor who, who brought his own table from here, and occupational therapies and physical therapies. And we situated them in this corner here. This is her, his table. These are all the other, the rest of the table where they did what they have to do. The stroke patients, the musculoskeletal patients. So, as I said, they also had 373 patients. So that was good and remarkable. And you can see here, this is the whole auditorium. Uh, over here is the medical services, pediatric, dental. We have the pharmacy here below the stage and on the stage are optometric services. It was not first come first, of the, they were assigned. And on the, on the sides are, are small rooms and you'll see what we use that for later. As I said, pharmacy services, by the way, you have to be US licensed to be able to practice medicine in that area. That, that's our requirement. You have to be licensed here. If you're retired and not licensed, you cannot touch patients. So you have to be US licensed and then also Philippine licensed. So Dr. Uh, Haller, our ultrasonographer, brought his own machine and uh, it's faster this year. Uh, he was able to do 40 patients a day as opposed to 20 last, last year. <laughs> And he was able to see 241 patients and refer <coughs> patients for surgery, uh, around 10 or 15 of them, for surgical excision, for minor surgery, and some of them, the hernia, the scrotal hernia, and things like that were also referred. And he was able to see one uh, gallstone, I think. So that was it. And uh, again, there's a, always a pre-med student watching, and you know they rotate. They have their own rotation. So for minor surgery, Washington Hospital is a star because uh, Gina Arguelles has been uh, in charge. She's, she's the lead uh, nurse here, takes care of everything. And we also have Lily Ramirez from Pediatrics who also volunteered and she's the circulating nurse for that area. And then of course we have our ER doc, Dr. Shwini Boss, um, who also volunteered, uh, recruited by Dr. Halimi. <laughs> and uh, Aaron Arguelles who's a clerk at the special care nursery was also there. Later on, I saw him already stitching, and he was being monitored, I mean, mentored by Dr. Srinivas, doing some stitches on a patient. So aside from treating the patient, we needed to also educate the patients as well as the healthcare workers. So with your donations, we, I bought some mannequins, you know. There's pediatric and child mannequins, and we taught 45 healthcare workers initially, and then later on, laymen. These are midwives, uh, lifeguards, because you know we're in that sea, seaside area, and also uh, emergency drivers. They're not certified in ACLS. We taught them about how to deal with drowning patients, CPR of drowning patients, uh, bleeding, and um, other things aside from the CPR. This is Janice Passion, wound care nurse, who was also in my team teaching them. And we also taught them about airway, airway management. Okay, so that's the outpatient department and all its services. Now, the inpatient de department is a four-story uh, hospital without elevator. And where's the OR? It's in the second floor. And where I was assigned is on the third floor, which is the recovery room. So, of course, we are mission volunteers. We cannot complain. So my assignment was the inpatient uh, doctor coordinator or liaison officer, so I have to check everything. I went to Central Supply, check their oxygen, check all these gadgets, which some of them are from Washington Hospital. Thank you very much. Um, and that's part of Central Supply. We didn't have a room, so we were in, the, uh, in front of the OR alley, and I just placed a guard there. He's a guard, and they make turns every four hours. 
Okay, so the surgical services recovery, at first we just have one room for pre-op and post-op patients for recovery. Then the following day we were able to at least get another room for our surgical services. It was a little bit chaotic, but it got better as the weeks got along. I wanna um, pause here and let you know that we got a laparoscope from Washington Hospital about two years ago. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the scope. This is the scope. This is the light source and this is the gas source. And our Biomed, uh, Dan Dublin from Washington Hospital Biomed also, in the last two years, were able to put them together, repair them, and finally this year we were able to use it. So this is our first laparoscopic case, cholecystectomy and see how small the wounds are, the, the incisions are, and we know that this, this patient will heal um, properly or faster. That's the beauty of the laparoscopic uh, surgeries. And this is Dr. Milon who did it, who's also a recruit of Dr. Kranti Achanta. Remember, Achanta and Halimi were with me two years ago. They recruited some more surgeons <laughs> for our team. Here's another doctor recruited also from O'Connor who did some thyroidectomies. And me and um, Rosina is an ICU nurse. Uh, she, uh, she did the recovery. And I'm just showing off some nebulizer and pulse oximetry that I got from respiratory staff from Rudy. Um, and so now my story. I, we have this two-year-old kid with a cleft lip. And after repair, she was not very happy. I thought she was in, he was in pain, but actually he just wanted something to drink or eat. I guess he was NPO, no food to drink after, uh, se before several hours. Another kid, two, I think she's around 10 months old, maybe, and she was happier. She's, she let us, you know, carry her. Okay, so my, uh, my important patient in the ICU, or I call it ICU, but it's active recovery, was an intubated patient that uh, got recovered from a complicated thyroid surgery, and we were worried about uh, inflammation and airway problem. So this patient was not on mechanical ventilator. She's able to breathe on her own, but we monitored her very closely and extubated her after 12 hours, I think, when she woke up. There, I just wanna show you her, um, old our suction machine it but it's working so we're using it and here's another one that we got from washington hospital our monitor it's old it just monitors your heart rate monitors your respiratory rate oxygen saturation and oxygen saturation so nowadays we can monitor blood pressure everything else you know with other options but this is good enough for us in recovery in the philippines so thank you again very much so we recovered patients, and I just want to show you what I did. Um, we were asking for more blankets because this patient's temperature was 95, hypothermic. We were able to get this hot water bag <laughs> and use it at least. So next time I'll probably get those electric blankets for recovery. So this is our team, and uh, this is our farewell party, Dr. Srinivasta, Rosina, and all the rest. And Dan Dublin uh, got an ovation because the uh, chief, uh, chief officer, chief doctor in the hospital was very happy about the biomedical team. We had three biomedical uh, technicians that came in and they fixed most of their equipments from the first floor to the fourth floor. Mm -hmm. So that's why they were very happy for free. And it's, uh, he said that some of the missions that came to them a long time ago did not have this. So a medical mission should always have a biomedical team. That's what they're saying. So here's the outpatient uh, minor surgery. And this is just to show you that on Thursday we have 19 cases in recovery. And every day we get our medical mission is statistics. We had 55 surgical patients for five days. We have an, two OBGYNs that did six surgeries two general surgeons, two urologists, um, one orthopedic and one podiatrist, you know, the surgeons that did it. This is just to show you how the nurses improvised a continuous bladder irrigation for a patient that had a complete prostatec prostatectomy. So we needed to irrigate the bladder. So we bought some distilled water, put it in this uh, big plastic bag and just turn it there and that's our bladder irrigation. <laughs> it worked. So, um, 
I just want to share with you the, the star of our, um, our mission was a four-month-old baby that had this congenital club fit we call uh, Talipes equinovirus. Uh, there, she's the star because we thought that this is promising. We did a lot of hysterectomies, cholecystectomy, but this has so much future. We can do something about it. So we have an orthopedic doctor and a podiatrist who planned this together with the anesthesiologist. They planned it, did the surgery, and several days um, after the surgery, they cast uh, the both feet. And of course, um, you know, they were all looking at him post-operatively. And just one cake make us all feel better. And <laughs> on the cake says, thank you for your help because of you, my feet is now fixed and beautifully normal. Love, Alexa. That was wonderful. It took away all the hardships, all the fatigue that we have that day. <laughs> and then February 2, few, several days later, look at her feet. It's really doing well now. It's straight. She has a chance to walk, to dance, to wear high heels in the future. <laughs> By the way, this patient will be cast for three months, and the orthopedic, the local orthopedic doctor is following up with us. So that's what we do when we leave. We, we sign them out to the proper surgeons, because this is a one-year one process of getting to know the place, making sure their resources, and things like that. So we're continually following them up. So we don't leave them alone. We also left them there are, are some of our supplies and medicines that we did not use anymore. We leave it to them. So that's that's our story. Just want to let you know we have a statistician. So if you're non-medical, you can do statistics, you can do photography, you, you can do a lot of things. And we have this. If you want to review it, we have it. And so I want to close again by thanking Washington Hospital and my Washington Hospital family for all your generosity. Your donations came a long way. Um, I hope you enjoy it, and thank you very much again. That's it. Thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, we need to thank you, I think. That kind of work uh, is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Every year. Is it every year you do this? Yeah, I thought so. I thought so. Wonderful work. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, we're going to take one of the action items out of, out of order. Uh, this is action item 7A. Uh, this has to do with uh, a revenue bond ordinance, and I'd like uh, Chris Henry, if he would, to introduce that item and introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, tonight we will uh, be asking the board to begin the process of um, refinancing our outstanding 2009 revenue bonds and also the possible issue of new money bonds for future capital needs. Um, the interest rates have come down significantly since the 2009 bonds were first issued. Uh, and there's an opportunity to generate an, an estimated annual savings of about $363,000 a year, including the new money bonds. Um, uh, we'll concurrently be uh, refinancing our 2009 general obligation bonds uh, with current estimates looking at a savings to the taxpayers of $2 million. Um, so tonight we're going to ask the board to proceed with the first reading of the ordinance that approves moving forward with the revenue bonds. Uh, but before we do that, um, we have, I'm proud to have our, uh, our uh, bond legal consultant, Liesl Wells, and um, our bond legal counsel, uh, Graham Beck, here uh, to remind you of what the pro how the process is going to go. There have been a few changes in the laws uh, uh, and um, to answer any questions you might have. Um, I want to introduce these folks. They haven't been here for a while. Um, Lisa Wells uh, is here in her capacity as our legal consultant. Over the past 40 years, she has assisted Washington Hospital in a number of capacities. First as counsel to the underwriter in our earliest revenue bond transactions and in recent years as bond counsel to WHHS. Liesl is an honor graduate of Wellesley College and a graduate of Stanford Law School where she was on law review. In between, she joined the Navy and has since retired from the Naval Reserve 
as a captain in the Judge Advocate General's Corps. In 1978, she served as bond counsel. Oh, since, excuse me, since 1978, she served as bond counsel to hundreds of California public agencies. In 2016, she retired from Nixon Peabody, our current bond counsel firm, but continues an active practice. During 2017 and 2018, Ms. Wells was an adjunct professor of law at Fowler Law School, Chapman University. Also with us, as I mentioned, was, uh, is Graham Beck, uh, Graham Beck is a partner in Nixon Peabody's finance, public finance group. He has served as bond counsel, disclosure counsel, and underwriters counsel on a broad range of tax exempt and taxable financings, including general obligation bonds, revenue bonds, lease revenue bonds, and certificates of participation. Much of Graham's work involves assisting school districts, healthcare districts, municipalities, and joint action agencies with their issuance of tax exempt debt to finance the construction and rehabilitation of public facilities to better meet the needs of their communities. Graham has assisted numerous local government agencies through the election process to win voter approval for their bond issuance and has experience with a variety of financing options available to California municipalities and government agencies, including general obligation bonds, revenue bonds, mellow roos financings, and certificates of participation. So with that, Liesl, I'll turn the podium over to you for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Good evening, members of the board, Ms. Farber. It's lovely to be here. And on behalf of the entire finance team, not all of whom are here, uh, we wish to express our gratitude for the faith and the confidence that you've shown in letting us help you with another one of your financing uh, proposals to help the capital program at the, at the district. <clears throat> the structure that's proposed here tonight, it's a part of a process, and this process is similar to what you've seen in the past, but it bears a couple of idiosyncrasies, and so I'd like to just outline those and take a few minutes to outline the process. The first reading tonight is of an ordinance that combines both the refunding issue that Mr. Henry spoke about and a potential new money issue. But over the course of the next few weeks, it may be possible that the new money issue is not necessary. In that case, the decision would be made and the new money piece would be dropped out of the financing and the size of the transaction would be reduced to simply cover the refunding. However, because we have the potential to do a new money piece, we have to follow the more complex requirements of the health and safety code. And the health and safety code is where we have this requirement to have an ordinance before the board that has two readings followed by a referendum period of 30 days in order to permit the district to sell bonds at a negotiated sale to Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith, as in the past. Okay, well, here's the second idiosyncrasy, the first one being that we might drop the new money piece out of the transaction. The second idiosyncrasy is that in about mid-May, Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith's affiliate, B of A Securities, will be taking over the purchase of bonds through the institution. So the ordinance <laughs> takes into account the fact that the name would change. The personnel are the same they would remain the same, the service to the district would be the same, and the fees would be the same. However, it may be possible, may be likely that we have to change the name of the underwriter later in the transaction. Okay, so that's the ordinance process. Now the next thing that happens, the second reading of the ordinance would be scheduled for March 27th. As I say, then there's a gap of 30 days. What we haven't addressed yet is the general obligation bond refunding of your 2009 issue. Now for that, of course, the taxpayers will be saving the money. The, Mr. Henry outlined the savings to the district on the revenue bonds. The taxpayers would save money from the refunding of the GO bonds. And that also is a substantial amount. When we do a refunding, we reduce interest rates that are paid by the taxpayers. So that process would be accomplished by taking a resolution to this board on May the 17th, May the 20th. Or thereabouts. 
yeah, about maybe, if the schedule holds. I mean, there, we have some flexibility in the schedule. And so there'd be a resolution authorizing paying off the general obligation bonds at a lower rate and, uh, and the resolution as well that would authorize issuing the revenue bonds at a lower rate and perhaps the new money piece. Those two resolutions will have assorted legal documents with which you're very familiar, your offering statement, um, and in, in escrow agreement to pay off the old bonds. And once that is taken care of, there's a marketing process with which you're familiar from the past, a sale of bonds, and then a projected closing in, in mid-June of this year. The first uh, series of bonds would be paid off on July the 1st. The second would be paid off on August the 1st. Whew. So those are the various steps involved in the process that is presented to you tonight. Um, we apologize for the complexity, but there are very good savings to be gained by the district and it's an excellent time to think about these things. So the goal is to position you to do the best you can. I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. Looks like you handled. It sounds very familiar to you by now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So, uh, uh, so on this item, 7A on the agenda today, which is Ordinance 19-01, which is approving a formal agreement for the private sale of Washington Township Healthcare District refunding and revenue bonds 2019 Series A. This ordinance approves the form of bond purchase contract for the negotiated sale of the bonds to the underwriter pursuant to the California Health and Safety Code. The ordinance will be brought back to the board for a second reading thereof. In addition, a resolution approving the bond issuance and approving the form of other necessary documents will be brought for approval at a future meeting of the board. At this time, I would open the floor to questions from members of the board. Are there any questions regarding the ordinance? I told you, you handled it. Uh, seeing none, at this point, I would open the floor to comments from members of the public. Do we have any comments from the members of the public tonight? Seeing none, uh, this will now be the first reading of that ordinance. Do you have a public comment? Is there a public comment? Yes. Yeah, we do have public comment. I'm sorry, on, on that, this I item. No, just on this item. That'll be fine. We're going to get to that in just a minute. We're ready. Thank you. So the first reading of this ordinance now I'm going to proceed with, which is Washington Township Healthcare District Ordinance Number 1901, approving a formal agreement for the private sale of the Washington Township Healthcare District Refunding and Revenue Bond Series 2019 Series A. So that concludes the first reading of that ordinance. And uh, we appreciate the help from our council and from uh, them traveling in and helping us with that. It's always nice to have it proceed in an orderly, nice manner. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Our next item on the agenda is for the approval of uh, minutes February 13th, 25th, and 27th. Can I have a motion on that? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. D, if you'd read the. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Eben? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Director Danielson? Thank you, D. Now we're at a point for oral communications from the, from the public. And I have two speaker cards. One is for Kim Lake. And I'd invite you to come forward here to the podium and uh, address the board as you please. We, we, do, we do wish you to limit your remarks, if you can, to about two minutes. OK, no problem. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Kim Lake, and I currently hold the position of Chief Nurse Representative here at Washington Hospital. I am here today because I care. I care about my patients, the amazing nurses I work with, and the community we serve. And I know you care too. There has been tremendous improvement in labor management relations, 
and as we enter into contract negotiations, it is our expressed hope for collaboration, mutual respect, and of course, our most important focus will always be on our patients' needs. It is only when we work together and find common ground that we are strong and continue to provide magnet status care to the patients in the community that we serve. I'm here on behalf of the hardworking nurses at Washington Hospital who respectfully request your support during upcoming contract negotiations. Consider the care you would hope for or the care you would want for those you love. Now consider what it takes to make that possible and together let's continue to make that happen. Thank you for your time and thank you for caring. Thank you very much, Kim. I also have a speaker card from Lily Marquez Wing. If you'd like to come forward and address the board. That's thank great. you. Good evening, Board of Directors of the Township of Washington Hospital. My name is Lily Marquez Wing. I am the Labor Representative for the California Nurses Association, which is the union that represents the nurses here at, at the Washington Hospital. But I'm also a resident of Fremont and an active member in the community here in the Tri-City area. As our Chief Nurse Rep mentioned, our nurses care very deeply about our patients and the community in the Tri-City. Our nurses go above and beyond to assure the patients are provided quality care for themselves and their family. Recently, nurses sent each and every one of you members a survey where it aligns and shows our nurses' values. The survey contains questions about adequate staffing, uh, patient care, making sure the rations are followed, and allow nurses to advocate for patients without fear of retaliation. However, we did not get a response from you from the survey. The community and the nurses want to hear from you directly. They want to know that you support them. Therefore, it is important that with diligence, you fulfill your responsibilities of selected board members and respond. Board, we'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that you are in an independent elected board of directors and the community is counting on you. We ask that you take time to fill out our survey and let the nurses know that you care about the patients and the nurses that serve in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lily. At this point, uh, we uh, move to item B on communications. That's to con uh, that's uh, a letter of resignation from Pat Danielson, uh, a present board member. We're going to take that item up uh, at the action items later on in the agenda. I will read that letter of resignation and we'll discuss that thoroughly, but we'll do that all in one action item later on in the agenda tonight. Uh, so that brings us now to Dr. Choi, Chief of Staff. Uh, good evening. I'd like to present the uh, credential action items. For our initial appointment for two years, we have uh, uh, Milan Chavarkar, a nurse practitioner. We have Jennifer Daman, MD of Pediatrics. Mark Sue. MD of Surgery Urology, uh, Sarpjit Hundle of uh, Surgery Ophthalmology. We have uh, Dr. Ijeoma Okejwi of OBGYN and Dr. Lawrence Tigliao, uh, OBGYN, hospitalist for WTMF. <clears throat> there are no initial appointments for one year or temporary privileges are being asked for Mark Sue of Urology Surgery. Uh, Next category is uh, reappointments for two year. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Steven Anderson of ophthalmology, Dr. Zhao Chuan Chen of internal medicine, Dr. Lawrence Elner of uh, podiatry, uh, Dr. Paul Gainer, anesthesiology, Dr. Prasad Kilaru of surgery, Dr. Michael Lamb of anesthesiology, Dr. David Lever, surgery, uh, Dr. David Lewis, anesthesiology, Dr. Jen Lin, Medicine, Dr. Jennifer Louie, Pediatrics, I'm Dr. Kenneth Lowe, Ophthalmology, Dr. Neil Nair, Anesthesiology, Dr. Mihir Patel, Internal Medicine, Dr. Payal Shaw, Infectious Disease, Dr. Gita Singh, Internal Medicine, Dr. Brian Smith, Anesthesiology, Dr. Robert Spears, Anesthesiology, uh, Dr. Samir Vora, Pulmonary Medicine, uh, Dennis Norman Watt, oral and maxillofacial surgery, and Dr. Vanessa Wilson, internal medicine. Under the category of reappointments for one year, we have uh, Kranthi Achanta of surgery, 
Sammy Hung, Pulmonary Medicine, Rabin Ketchapal, uh, Internal Medicine, David Larson, Radiation Oncology, uh, Hong Lin of Interventional Radiology, and Dennis Dale Minkin of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. Under transfer and staff category, we have uh, Dr. Lisa Arcilla going from active to active, I mean provisional active to active, sorry. Uh, Dr. Vishal Bantha, provisional active to active. Uh, Dr. Cesar Javahirian, provisional active to active. Dr. Alex Fox, emergency medicine, provisional active to active. We have Sammy Hung going from courtesy to active. Dr. David Lewis, anesthesiology from active to ambulatory. Dr. De Mitkin, uh, courtesy to ambulatory, and Dr. Daniel Z from provisional courtesy to courtesy. Under completion of proctoring and prior to eligibility for advancement in staff category, we have Natalie Tett, internal medicine intensivist. <clears throat> Under completion of proctoring and advancement in staff category, all going from provisional active to active, we have Lisa Arcilla of pediatrics, Vishal Bantia, otolaryngology, Cesar Javahirian of uh, emergency medicine, and Alex Fox, also of emergency medicine. Under the category delete privilege requests, we have Dr. Vishal Bantia and Dr. Prasad Kilaru. Uh, conflicts of interest were noted for uh, s several physicians, including Kranti Achanta, Stephen Anderson, Sarbjit Handel, Prasad Kilaru, Bruce Lynn, and Brian Smith, and Vanessa Wilson, where they updated their provider, healthcare provider entities that they're affiliated with. <coughs> Under leave of absence, we have Mary Mesh of thoracic surgery. Uh, there was one application that was withdrawn from Adur Adroni, and there are um, two resignations, Dr. William Brown of general surgery, and Dr. Milford Zauslow of anesthesiology. motion on that item. Move it. Move Mr. President, I move for approval of the production action items as presented by Dr. Troy. Thank you. A second? Second. second. We have a second. Second. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> we got it. Uh, D, if you'd uh, take the roll. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Nicholson. Aye. Director Epen. Aye. Director Wallace. Aye. Great. That motion passes. Now this evening we're ready for our service league report. This is, we introduced to you Ruth Magatha, who is now uh, the new service league president. We welcome you here with us. It'll be good to hear your report. I wanted to say just a few words about Ruth. That'd be great. Because she is new to this meeting, um, but she's hardly new to Washington Hospital. Um, she retired as an employee of the Washington Hospital Healthcare System in June of 2014 after 38 years of service. And now she has found yet another way to serve our community and our hospital. She earned a bachelor's degree um, at William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri, where she met her husband, Virgil. After they moved to California, she joined the hospital in September of 1977 as a phlebotomist and laboratory assistant. She was quickly promoted to leave laboratory assistant and phlebotomy supervisor. As we introduced our EPIC system to the hospital, she moved into the information technology department, which is where she retired from. And we are very lucky to have Ruth with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farley. Hello um, to the board, it's nice to be here, so I hope to be able to walk in the footsteps of those that preceded me. So from the president's meeting, I attended my first uh, event was to attend the California Volunteers Conference, which was held in Sacramento, California in February. Uh, it was a great conference. Um, I um, attended a session that was very interesting that was that talked about where do we go from here uh, with volunteering in our current society. And the biggest subject of, that had the largest attendance in the breakout was con, was called Understanding and Improvements for the New Homeless uh, SB 1152. Standing room only, basically, for that uh, particular session. It was very interesting as to what the hospitals across our state is up against and what they are doing to help implement this program at the various hospitals in our state. So many, many ideas out there as to how um, 
the different organizations are working with this new SB 1152. So those are some things that um, we will be sharing with our volunteer department this year. We also, um, in February, February was a busy month, we had our annual luncheon. Um, at that luncheon, we um, put, brought forth our um, nominees for the year, and I was elected as the new president in February, so this is my first meeting. So um, I will be here for the next 12 months, excuse the nerves for today, but um, I hope to be working with everyone going forward in a very smooth transition. Um, and as Ms. Farber said, I did work here um, for 38 years, so a lot of the faces are familiar as I look around the room, so that's nice to see. So thank you all for that. Um, one of the other things that did occur at the annual meeting this year was the um, volunteer board made their annual presentation to the hospital as they do each year. This year the presentation was made to the special care nursery. We will be helping them with a remodel which will include some painting, some pictures uh, to make it look pretty up there. We're taking care of babies in a level two nursery and we want the parents to feel oh, you know, a nice atmosphere up there. It's, they said it's been kind of the same for the last few years and they were looking for a change. So this year the board, um, the service lead board has uh, de uh, approved donating our funds this year to help improve the area on the second floor in the special care nursery. And the last thing that we're working on currently for volunteer services is to upgrade our software program that we use in the gift shop. So this week we started training and we expect to go live in April. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that, but the team is very excited for what they will be able to do uh, with the new software application, the new reports they can run, how much quickly it is for them to retrieve information, information and to help the auditors with the auditing process. So that is my report for the first time out and I look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you, Ruth. You did great. <laughs> <laughs> nerves, nerves aside, you did, you did just fine. Thank you. It's, truly, it's wonderful to have you here. The, the volunteers are a very, very important part of the hospital. Yes, and, they are. Uh, we always have that in our minds whenever we're doing anything. Thank you. Thank you. Medical staff report. So I have to report that we have uh, 594 members on the medical staff. Of those are 354 active members and 102 ambulatory. Thank you, Dr. Choi. Uh, we're now ready for the hospital calendar. Uh, we can watch the, show the video at this point. Past health promotions and outreach events. On Wednesday, February 20th, Dr. Anna Malai Virapan, Gastroenterology, and Kimberly Alvari, Director of Food and Clinical Nutrition Services and Chief of Patient Experience, presented Colorectal Cancer, Foods to Eat and Avoid. 37 people attended. On Thursday, February 21st, as part of the Women Empowering Women series, Dr. Victoria Leaphart, gynecologist, presented Healthy Gut, Healthy You. 14 people attended. On Thursday, February 21st, as part of the Speakers Bureau program, Christy Casey, Director of Rehab and Occupational Therapy, and Rebecca McCulloch, Director of Respiratory Care Services, presented Career Choices in Rehab and Respiratory Services to the Medical Explorers Post 539. Students learned about the role of rehab and respiratory services and educational requirements. 39 students attended. On Friday, February 22nd, Washington Sports Medicine provided athletic trainers and hosted a first aid booth at the Special Olympics Basketball Tournament at Newark Memorial High School. 253 local athletes participated in this event. On Saturday, February 23rd, Washington Township Medical Foundation hosted a special health fair at their Newark location. This fun and free community event included glucose, cholesterol, blood pressure, and body mass index screenings, and an opportunity to talk to experts on health insurance, diabetes, nutrition, heart disease, and stroke. More than 125 people attended the event, and 113 screenings were provided. 
On Saturday, March 2nd, as part of the Speakers Bureau program, Dr. Seema Sagal, psychiatry, Dr. Victoria Leaphart, gynecologist, and Dr. Catherine Dow, cardiologist, participated in the Strategies for Wellness event hosted by Alameda County's Commission on the Status of Women. The event featured topics on suicide prevention, women's health, domestic violence, human trafficking, and personal safety. 52 people attended. On Wednesday, March 6th, experts from Fremont Bank presented how to prevent financial elder abuse and fraud. Washington Hospital and Fremont Bank co-hosted this important educational seminar. 52 people attended. Upcoming health promotions and community outreach events. On Saturday, March 16th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., Washington Hospital will host Stroke Awareness Day. This event screens community members for carotid artery blockage, atrial fibrillation, in addition to cholesterol, glucose, and blood pressure screenings. The event also includes stroke education, particularly learning the signs of a stroke and the importance of calling 911. It is vital for our community to learn every second wasted is heart or brain tissue lost, increasing the risk for death or disability. By calling 911, emergency providers are equipped with knowledge and resources to begin treatment needed in the shortest amount of time. This event is co-sponsored by Fremont Bank Foundation. Appointments are available for screenings at this event. To register, please call 800-963-7070. On Tuesday, March 19th, from 3 to 5 p.m., Father Jeff Finley, Palliative Care Coordinator, will present Advanced Care Planning, Five Wishes. At this seminar, learn tips on how to start the conversation of identifying values and goals to create a legal document that puts your wishes in writing. On Thursday, March 21st, from 7 to 8.30 p.m., as part of the Women Empowering Women series, Dr. Victoria Leapart will present Laugh Without Leaking, Understanding Female Urinary Incontinence. On Thursday, March 26th, from 6 to 8 p.m., at the Washington Township Medical Foundation Nakamura Clinic Conference Room in Union City, Vida Reed, RN, will present Stop Diabetes Before It Starts. On Wednesday, April 3rd, from 6 to 8 p.m., Dr. Prasad Kata, endocrinologist, will present Metabolic Disorders. At this seminar, learn about different types of metabolic disorders, causes, symptoms, and treatment options. On Thursday, April 4th, from 7 to 8 p.m., as part of the Diabetes Matters program, Dr. Jeannie Ahn, nephrologist, will present Kidney Health and Diabetes. On Tuesday, April 9th, and Tuesday, April 16th, from 10 a.m. to noon, Melissa Reyes, RN, will provide a two-part education series on stroke. Part 1, Stroke Prevention, will educate community members about prevention, symptoms, and what to do if you're experiencing signs of a stroke. Part 2, Life After Stroke, is an overview on how to better understand your condition and how to move forward after a stroke. Bay Area Healthier Together Washington Hospital's partnership with ABC7 continues to provide health-related information and education through on-air programming and on BayAreaHealthierTogether.com. The feature topic during the month of February was heart health, featuring Dr. Ramin Beggy, cardiothoracic surgeon and medical director of cardiothoracic surgery, plus articles on common risk for heart disease and what you need to know about aortic valve disease. The Washington Hospital Healthcare Foundation Report. The foundation will host the 34th annual golf tournament at Castlewood Country Club on Thursday, May 2nd, 2019. Held in memory of Fremont businessman Jean Angelo Pisano, the tournament promises a day of great golf and fun surprises. To reserve your foursome or to sponsor the event, please call Washington Hospital Healthcare Foundation at 510-818-7350. The Washington Township Healthcare District Board of Directors Report. Washington Township Healthcare District Board members attended the Fremont Education Foundation's Excellence in Education Gala on Friday, February 22nd. At the gala, the Fremont Education Foundation recognized Washington Hospital Healthcare System as the Excellence in Education Community Honoree 
for the support the health system has provided the Education Foundation through the years. State Senator Bob Wachowski and Fremont Mayor Lily May both presented commendations to the hospital. Board President Dr. Bernard Stewart accepted the award and commendations on behalf of the Board of Directors of Washington Township Healthcare District and the employees of Washington Hospital. Board members also attended the Deaf Plus Adult Communities Hope Grows Here Gala on Saturday, February 23rd, and abode services Journey Home Breakfast on Friday, March 1st. On Saturday, March 2nd, at the annual Woman of the Year celebration at Chabot Community College, Assembly Member Bill Quirk presented board member Pat Danielson with a Life Achievement Award for her dedication to public service and her tireless advocacy for health care in Southern Alameda County. Washington on Wheels Wow Mobile Health Clinic the Washington on Wheels Mobile Health Clinic WOW is a mobile medical unit providing quality health care services primarily to uninsured and underserved district residents. WOW brings Washington Hospital's commitment to patient-first care to clients throughout the district. During the month of February, WOW served community members at the following locations. In Fremont, the Family Resource Center and TCV Food Bank and Thrift Store. In Union City, the Ruggeri Senior Center, Union City Family Center, and Our Lady of the Rosary Church. In Newark, the Viola Blythe Community Services Center and the Salvation Army. These community partners provide social services to families in need and the homeless population. WOW also conducted hearing and vision screenings for students of the Fremont Unified School District State Preschool Program. The total number of community members receiving health care from the Washington on Wheels Mobile Health Clinic during the month of February was 175. Internet and Social Media Marketing Washington Hospital's website serves as a central source of information for the communities the district serves and beyond. The hospital's employment section was February's most viewed web page with 37,652 views. The hospital's social media presence is measured through total reach and engagement stats. The total reach statistic represents the number of people who saw a Washington Hospital Facebook post. Social media posts may reach a user via a news feed, which is most common, a user's page timeline, or via a direct link to a hospital post. The engagement statistic represents users who liked, commented, shared, or clicked on a Washington Hospital Facebook post. In Health, Channel 78. During the month of February, Washington Hospital's cable channel 78, In Health, captured new programming, including a Diabetes Matters program called Diabetes and Heart Health, two health and wellness programs titled Aortic Valve Disease, What You Should Know About TAVR, Colorectal Cancer and Foods to Eat and Avoid, and the February Citizens Bond Oversight Committee meeting. In addition, In Health aired Voices in Health, Antimicrobial Stewardship, and the February Board of Directors meeting. Awards and Recognitions The Commission on Cancer awarded Washington Hospital a three-year with commendation accreditation for meeting the seven commendation level standards. Washington Hospital is one of three facilities in California to have achieved four or more consecutive Outstanding Achievement Awards. The COC accreditation challenges cancer programs to enhance the care they provide by addressing patient-centered needs and measuring the quality of the care they deliver against national standards. COC accreditation provides value through improved patient outcomes across all domains of care access and service, satisfaction and well-being. COC accredited cancer programs are dedicated to providing the best in patient-centered care. The Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, AAMI, is a nonprofit organization of approximately 7,000 professionals united by one important mission, the development, management, and use of safe and effective health technology. Washington Hospital's Director of Biomedical and Green Initiative, Paul Kelly, has been selected to receive the 2019 Spirit of AAMI Award. For more than two decades, Paul has exemplified what it is to be an AAMI volunteer leader through his professionalism, selfless commitment, and willingness to share his expertise. 
Since joining AAMI in 1992, Paul has contributed to several AAMI publications, given presentations at conferences and events, participated in the development of AAMI standards, has been a member of the AAMI Board of Directors, and served on numerous committees. Congratulations, Paul. For more information on any of the programs mentioned, visit whhs.com or call 800-963-7070. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our employee of the month, and this is Maria Ezekiel. She is an executive assistant in the Human Resources Department. It's really important, the first impression that's created when you walk into a, a Human Resource Department anywhere, but we consider it very important here as well. And it's important the first point of contact be professional, um, welcoming, and also efficient. In May of 2015, we found the right person for that role, and that's Maria. Her passion and dedication to her role was never more evident than recently when a staff change left a void that needed immediate filling. Though some of the responsibilities were outside her experience, she stepped up without hesitation and skillfully began tackling her new tasks. She does her job quietly and efficiently, says Alan Callick, the Director of Human Resources. Her co-workers appreciate that she's always willing to lend a hand. And soon she will be transitioning to, into a new and expanded role that will utilize hopefully her full skill set. She has four children three sons and one daughter um, who attends Washington High School. Maria is especially pleased that two of her sons work for Washington Hospital. Zach Zapanta is a dialysis technician and Nick Zapanta recently came on board as a storekeeper. When asked what she loves most about her job, Maria replies without hesitation, my co-workers. We have a great team in human resources. Her co-workers agree with her, of course, and they feel she's a very important part of her team. So we want to congratulate Maria. I'm very happy that she's with us. Thank you, Nancy. We're ready for a quality report. Uh, yes. Mary Bowler. Thank you. Welcome, Mary. I am presenting our quality dashboard for quarantine 12 uh, 2018 and we'll start off with looking at the core measure uh, venous thromboembolism. So these are the bundle of approaches that we take on every patient admitted to the hospital who meets for um, needing interventions to prevent them from developing a clot. So we look at patients inside the critical care setting and outside the critical care setting and this is a CMS requirement. Um, they have established it where now they're getting it electronically from every medical record. Um, it's kind of a new way of doing it in the last couple of years, so they still do not have a benchmark. But overall, we're doing really well with that. On the patients that are outside of a critical care setting, we were able to meet the standard of having the interventions done for these patients at 95% of the time. And then for patients in the critical care setting, 99% of the time they had their um, SCDs in place and had the education and the prevention methods. So I think we're doing well with preventing clot development in the hospital. Um, and moving into stroke, another one of the core measures that we continue to look at, um, the same sort of bundle approach. Um, our compliance for patients that um, we need to make sure are, are on the right medications prior to discharge so that they will prevent uh, clot development after having a stroke is about 97% compliance. It's a little slightly below the, um, the national and state um, benchmark, which is 99%. So 2% 2, 2 below, that was um, about one patient. Um, and then that patient was phone called afterwards and we got the medications um, set up and the education done properly with that patient. Moving into stroke education, every patient that needed and required education for prevention of uh, stroke symptoms, um, they all left with the appropriate education. This education is done at the bedside with a nurse and um, there's a lot of good information and teaching for the family 
family and the patients at that time. And also, these patients need to be assessed for rehabilitation and see if they need it. And we can start those services while in hospital and make sure that they have follow-up after leaving the hospital. And for that, we were at 98% compliance, um, roughly pretty close to the national and state level. Moving into our infection prevention indicators, central line associated bloodstream infections. Um, this is something that for the last couple quarters, you know, we had had some struggles with looking at, um, you know, this measure to see, you know, what can we do to bring it down? Because we had been above the national um, benchmark from CDC for two quarters. And for quarter ending 1218, we're actually able to uh, bring this down pretty significantly. Um, this is about three central line bloodstream infections in a med surge setting. Um, one of the things that we did differently in this last quarter and the quarter before was really looking at what preventative methods can we set in place in a standard process? So making sure that um, patients who have central lines in place have the, the right kits available so that way we can make sure that we're, when we go to change the dressing that it's um, a standard up-to-date packet of how we do that and they have all their supplies together at once and we've done that, done a lot of education around this and I think we're seeing some of the benefit with that, a pretty significant um, drop in this last quarter. Uh, the other thing that we continue to do is every single day um, all patients with central lines are reviewed to make sure that we still meet the medical necessity of that line needing to be in place. Um, for example, if a patient is no longer on an antibiotic that requires a central line, uh, then let's get the central line out. If the central line is out, um, the risk of infection obviously um, is, is down to zero at that point. So central line medical necessity is a big part of that. We'll continue to work on both of these, hopefully um, get it below the national benchmark from the CDC. Um, Hospital-associated MRSA, so again, that is the, um, the pathogen that's very resistant to um, antibiotics, and we've been looking at stewardship related to these cases, and we've continued to have zero for years, um, well, not years, sorry, for the last couple of years, and continue to um, have some success with that in this quarter, so that was zero. Um, these are all, again, reported to the CDC and to CMS. Um, same thing with the other very difficult resistant bug to vancomycin. Um, continued to um, see good success here. Now we're at um, four out of the six quarters where we have not had VRE infections in the blood for these patients, and that includes critical care. Uh, C. difficile, I, I think this is something that we continue to um, look at. Um, we, we look at C. diff management actually on a day-to-day -day basis here with the infection control team, working very closely with ID, working very closely with environmental services. This is really a multi-dis um, group that works together very closely to see what we can do to prevent the C. diff infections. So this quarter, we did have an uptick to this. This is 11 um, C. diff infections. So, and again, this is um, a patient that more than three days after admission, test positive for C. diff in their stool. It is not looking at anything further than that. That's the way the CDC has the measures set up. They call it lab ID C. diff um, positive, which means that basically they became positive. They don't look at the clinical picture. Um, this is a time that we're hoping they'll move closer to looking at that, and this will be a better, um, sort of more meaningful metric. But until then, um, we um, have seen this uptick, but we do look at a really deep dive on each case. Each case, when we have a hospital-associated central line effect, um, I mean, a, a hospital-associated C. diff infection, it goes straight out to the unit, it goes out to the manager, it goes to the ID doc, the attending doc, infection control. We really look at these. And out of these 11, we found three that we thought um, you were more related to uh, a patient just having the C. diff um, infection without being symptomatic, since about a third of the population walks around being positive for C. diff. And in, in fact, these patients um, probably um, shouldn't have met testing criteria for this, because uh, you don't want to test somebody who's not symptomatic and then be treating and, and using antibiotics in an improper manner. So what we've done as a result is um, there's a C. diff task force that is um, looking now at updating our algorithm and really working closely with nursing, physicians, ID docs to make sure that patients are tested appropriately and that they meet the qualifications to be tested. So. Um, I don't think that that is typically a, um, an increase that's related to transmission-based precautions is what I'm saying. It's, it's much more something that we can operationalize getting better um, testing around. So that's our focus. We'll see how that goes. Um, but, but I think everybody knows we've had a lot of success in the prior quarters bringing this down. 
Um, moving into surgical site infections, uh, colon surgeries are um, something that um, all hospitals are required to look at um, um, daily and report out on quarterly to the CDC. We continue to be at zero for that. There's a high risk uh, surgery for surgical site infections, so it's great to see that at zero for the uh, third quarter in a row and abdominal hysterectomies. Um, you can see a long stream of looking at that, and we have not had any abdominal hysterectomies, surgical site infections. These um, are also reported to CMS because um, they're high risk for, um, for surgical site infections. And um, we also work with the ID docs to review these cases closely to make sure that the patient does not in fact have an infection. Doing really well with that. Nursing sensitive indicators. Um, um, we are happy to report that um, for the quarter ending 12-18, we did not have any moderate falls in, 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 that resulted in an injury. This was actually zero. Um, and considering sort of where census was starting to peak up towards the end of this quarter, um, that's, that's it's a real good reflection of the care that um, is occurring here with patients that are high risk. So patients are assessed upon admission, and if they are um, high risk for fall, of course, there are numerous interventions that are put into place to make sure that these patients um, do not fall. And I think that um, we're continuing to see some good outcomes from that. Our Joint Commission National Patient Safety Calls. Um, handoff communication is something that, you know, Joint Commission uh, has continued to look at, just making sure that um, we are doing some direct observation of um, handoff communication, because that is a very important part of the process on making sure that communication is in place and that patients are getting the appropriate um, care and transition and things aren't lost at things like shift change. So in this um, particular quarter, we looked and um, did not see any issues with uh, handoff communication. So that's great. SBAR took place on every case that we looked at. Patient ID, another um, thing that we continued to see at about 100% compliance. And this was done in various departments in the hospital and procedure uh, areas and uh, was at 100%. Same with procedure, timeout. Uh, we had had a couple quarters before where um, we had had some documentation issues where the timeout occurred, but it wasn't the documented quite right. Um, I think after some of the education that's occurred, we haven't even seen those one or two offs in this quarter. <laughs> Hand hygiene, um, it's, it's at 84.9% for this quarter. Um, it, so of course it is up prior to where it was before, but it continues to be a challenge for us. The um, Joint Commission goal for this is 90%, and it, and it seems like it would, that Joint Commission would put this at 100%, but they do not because typically the national average on hand hygiene compliance is closer to about 50%. And so, um, 84.9 though is still alarming to us and everybody has really taken this seriously because um, we've been dealing with this issue for the last couple quarters. So basically the patient safety group is coming together again with the um, medical staff leadership, uh, myself and quality infection control, patient safety officer, and we're going to revamp um, and look at refreshing the program and we're actually looking at all sorts of um, different more innovative ideas. Hand hygiene is something that you will never be able to stop um, looking at um, and reviewing your program and it's it's to that point again we'll, we'll always have to be looking for innovative ideas we'll always have to be looking at ways that we can improve data collection how do you get that information back to the people who are observed and get the education done right away so um, some of that is in process dr. Martin's working with us very closely about this she's passionate about this subject and um, hopefully we'll um, see a rise in those the other thing we've done is we have more um, trained observers in the hospital and so and we actually do observations here on weekends. Uh, we have infection control staff. We have trained um, people that are um, on patient safety that are looking at this. So it's um, something that we'll, we'll continue to work at. Readmissions rates. Um, this The readmission rates are basically um, determined by how CMS defines looking at a patient um, who has come into the hospital. And then for any um, need at all is ret um, returns to the hospital within 30 days for um, any cause. And so pneumonia is a focus area for this and um, ours are actually lower than the national standard for pneumonia. And this is about the fifth quarter out of six where we've seen it lower um, than the um, CMS national benchmark at 16.7. And we were at 10.7, uh, meaning that six out of 56 patients came back with a cause, um, actually these six actually came back without even having respiratory issues, um, but 
they qualify as a readmission. Uh, much more want to focus on looking at uh, what we can do to prevent patients who have heart attacks and then come back within 30 days. And so we had five patients uh, this last quarter out of 22 um, patients that um, were potential for readmissions. It puts us at 22.7. This is um, uh, continues to be above the national benchmark. So. Well, the readmissions committee um, is looking at heart failure and COPD, but we're obviously going to have to look at the AMI related one. The interesting thing about these five patients is that one um, of them did have, um, it was sort of like a cardiac um, issue that related to their readmission, but the other four did not. Um, they had uh, respiratory issues and a UTI. So. Um, those are hard to, you know, really drill down and see what could you do differently. But um, we are doing um, extra standards and, and looking really focusing on um, heart failure, which for um, this quarter we were slight, slightly above the um, national benchmark. So 12 out of 50 patients um, did return within 30 days. Um, these were high risk patients. Um, we determined and score the risk um, of patients while they're in here for their first admission. And of these 12, um, they were high risk for coming back. Uh, we were focusing on a lot of things right now in the committee, um, making sure that these patients are phoned within um, three to four days after leaving the hospital. Were you able to get back and see your primary doctor? Were you, did you make it to the appointment that we set up? Do you have transportation? Um, uh, do you have any questions about your medications? Things like this, really following up with them afterwards makes a big difference. We have a dedicated um, clinical person in the quality department who's been making these calls. And it is, um, it is pretty eye-opening when you listen to what these patients go through when they go home. A lot of them don't have the, uh, the support, um, you know, they're trying to manage um, their weights and their diet and everything. And if you live alone or your, your partner is elderly, it's, it's hard, it's challenging. And so um, we're trying to get them the right home health support, making sure that we're working with their primary care doctor afterwards and um, that we're doing the best we can to get them set up for success prior to discharge. And we'll continue um, to work on that. And those are the uh, last of the readmission metrics. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you. Any questions from the board on Mary's presentation? No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you again. Thanks. We're ready now for a finance report from uh, Chris Henry. Okay, tonight we'll be looking at Washington Hospital's operational and financial results for January 2019. Um, average daily census for the month came in at 192.6. We had expected 210.1 for the month. Uh, admissions came in 272 below budget at 1,062. Patient days came in uh, about 541 below budget at 5,972. And again, those numbers are affected by the shift, you know, primarily in joints um, as well as other activity. But joints are a big driver there from out inpatient to the outpatient uh, arena. Outpatient ob uh, observation equivalent days for the month came in 70 above budget at 207. And our average length of stay based on discharge days. 0.3 above budget at 5.18 for January. Moving into utilization, case mix index for the month came in a little bit lower than we anticipated at 1.414. Uh, we had 110 deliveries for the month that continued lower uh, as we'd been seeing all year. Uh, we had budgeted for 149. Um, surgical cases were 14 above the budget at 428. Uh, that includes our joint replacement cases uh, that were six below budget, neurosurgical cases were seven below budget at 23, cardiac surgical cases at three below budget at five. So really um, the positive variance driven in general surgeries uh, for the month. Cath lab procedures for the month, uh, 54 above budget at 400. Uh, our outpatient visits in January were uh, 7,485, 522 above the budget. And our emergency room continued uh, with lower volume uh, and lower than last year too, uh, 4,607 visits in January. We had expected 5,357. Quick look at the um, distribution of cath lab activity in January. Peripheral vascular procedures uh, made up the, uh, the largest piece of the pie, 43%. Uh, 
Cardiac procedures uh, uh, made up 37% of the activity, uh, followed by nonvascular interventional radiology and neurointerventional radiology procedures. Looking at uh, productivity, um, productive FTEs for the month uh, came in 143, a little more than 143 below budget at 1,365.6. We saw 1,075.2 non-productive FTEs in the month, leaving us with total FTEs that were 146.2 below budget at 1,540.8. Our full-time equivalents per adjusted occupied bed for the month, um, uh, a lot lower than we expected uh, at 5.6. We had budgeted for 6.29. And I'll tell you, the staff is working really hard as we go through our periods of high census. They're, they're working really hard. Um, so productivity looked uh, pretty good. Moving into financials, uh, this is our Governmental Accounting Standards Board presentation that we always start with. This is the presentation that we use for our audited financials. Um, gross patient revenue for the month came in $13.5 million below budget at $202,903,000. Our uh, contractual write-offs for the month came in lower than expected at 78.64%. Couple things going on in there. Our, our actual uh, contractual allowances with insurance companies uh, actually were a little higher um, than expected. This is insurance companies and government-sponsored patients. Um, there was a shift in the payer mix. Uh, we did have higher governmental-sponsored patients, which um, really are the lowest payers that we see. Um, and our PPO uh, revenue was below budget. Uh, PPO ended up at, um, hold on, I have that here. PPO was 21.8%. Was, uh, We'd expected 22.2%, and that really has a big impact on these numbers. We did get some help um, in our provision for charity and bad debt. Uh, that number's been running high all year. Uh, in January, we did see it drop, so we had a little relief there uh, at 1.39% of gross revenue. Um, uh, we had budgeted for 2.09, but we've been running much higher than that during the year, so we got a little bit of a breather there. So we ended up with, our, as I said, our total deductions from revenue at 78.64% against a budget of 79.09%. And all that adds up to um, net operating revenue, a little more than 1.9 million below budget at $45,312,000. Operating expenses for the month were $319,000 below, or excuse me, above budget uh, at $42,620,000. Had a couple of, of big drivers here. One, our, our salaries and wages were about a million dollars lower than budget with our lower FTEs. Um, supplies were about $321,000 above budget. We saw that in the areas of prosthetics and cardiac and neuro, uh, neuro, neurology supplies. Uh, and our benefits were above budget by about a million one. And I want to take just a minute to explain this. Um, uh, uh, the underlying investments in our pension plan are, are invested in a number of different types of vehicles, including equities. Um, and um, as we saw uh, towards the end of the year last year, we saw a big dip in the equity markets that affected those, uh, those assets. Those have since come back, but because our pension plan is based on a calendar year, we have to do our actuarial calculations, which would determine what our annual expense is going to be as of December 31st. So up to the fourth quarter of the calendar year, we were earning modest gain of about 2.8%. But after that fourth quarter, uh, at December 31st, we were holding a 6% unrealized, and this is important, unrealized loss on our investments. Um, it's a paper loss. It's not a real loss. But the way the accounting rules work is we have to recognize that in our actuarial calculations, which result in increased expense for our fiscal year. So starting in January and moving up through the end of the fiscal year, we'll be recognizing an additional $1.3 million a month to account for this unrealized loss on investments. Um, it's, not a, it's not a cash loss, but it's something we have to recognize. So really that's what drove our investments above budget, 1.1 million. 
and we'll be talking about that some more this year, I'm sure. So we end up the month with um, operating income of a little bit less than 2.7 million. We'd expected uh, 4.965 million for the month. So below budget about a little less than $2.3 million. And again, that includes that $1.3 million adjustment. Um, Non-operating income for the month came in above budget. At $314,000, we'd expected a loss of $287,000 in the month. That included um, an unrealized gain in our investments of $383,000. So we end up uh, the month of January from a GASB perspective with a total bottom line a little bit over $3 million, uh, about a million six, million seven below budget. Quick look at our Financial Accounting Standards Board presentation. So to get to these numbers, we move our interest expense out of non-operating uh, uh, into operating expenses. We eliminate our tax revenue that supports the debt service on our general, general obligation bond uh, uh, debts. So we end up with operating income from a FASB perspective of a little bit under $2 million. We expected uh, about $4.1 million. Um, and we end up from a FASB perspective with non-operating income at $324,000, uh, pretty close to the budget of $329,000, and a total bottom line from a FASB perspective of uh, a little bit more than $2.3 million. Uh, quick look at um, our earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. This helps us get a better idea of how, of how the operation actually was. Um, it does carry that $1.3 million adjustment, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, but from an, what we do from an EBITDA standpoint is we pull depreciation out of operating expenses because that's really a, a non-cash uh, number. It's a recognition of cash that has occurred in the past. So we come up with an EBITDA uh, bottom line of $6.4 million uh, against a budget of $8.678 million. And um, if you look down below, uh, we, our, our operating, our non-operating activities exclusive of that interest expense generated another uh, $2.1 million. So, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, results of those two things providing about $8.6 million to cover that interest expense and other obligations of the district. So we're still producing, uh, the operation really still producing pretty good returns. So are there any questions on January? I don't think we have any, uh, Chris, so we can move on to the okay. hospital operations report. We'll start with our preliminary gross revenue figures. Um, we had 182.9 million for the month of February, and that came in below budget by 1.6 million, or about a nine tenths of a percent variance. Interestingly, though, we came in above February a year ago by 23.4 million dollars. Inpatient gross revenue of 130.5 million was below budget by 11.8 million, or an 8.3 percent negative variance. Um, 8.9% above February a year ago. Our outpatient gross revenue came in at $52.4 million and was above budget by $10.2 million. That's a 24.2% positive variance <clears throat> and a $12.8 million uh, dollar improvement above February a year ago. The shift from inpatient to outpatient is primarily due to what we've been talking about throughout this year, the, sh the joint replacement surgery shifting into the outpatient setting. In terms of the major drivers of revenue variance, our emergency room visits were below budget by 328, um, driving emergency revenue down by $3.7 million. Room and board revenue was down by 3.3 million. Inpatient days were above budget by 167, um, and that drove room and board revenue up by 2.3 million. 
and this was offset by our deferred market pricing adjustments that we had planned. Um, and that would have amounted to about 5.6 million. Cath lab procedures are above budget by 43, um, driving cath lab procedures revenue above budget by $3 million. That's a 25.6% positive variance. Surgical services had a favorable case mix and drove the, their revenue above budget by $3.3 million. That's a 10.4% positive variance. In terms of our key census statistics, the average length of stay was 5.82. We had budgeted 4.83. Um, February of 2019 saw 47 discharged uh, patients compared to 21 in 2018 with lengths of stay ranging from 20 to greater than 100 days. And that's one of the things that drives the, that data. Outpatient observation days were nine above budget at 131 days. Um, average daily census of 201 was above budget by, above the budget of 195 by six days. In terms of our admissions trends, we had um, 140 fewer um, than we had planned. Um, we had budgeted 989, so it's a 12.4% negative variance. Major drivers of the admissions variance included inpatient cath lab admissions that did come in um, above budget by 38, inpatient surgeries that were below budget by 78, deliveries that were below budget by 35, and medical admissions that were below budget by 65. In terms of our patient days, we had 5,621 for the month, and they came in above budget by 167. Surgical trends. Um, our total surgical cases in February of 361 were below budget by nine cases. Inpatient surgeries were 78 below budget at 208. Outpatient surgeries were 69 above budget at 153. The increase in outpatient surgeries was primarily due to joint replacement shifting from inpatient to outpatient. And this shift is being driven as we discussed over and over again by Medicare requirements. <clears throat> in terms of surgical activity, general surgical procedures came in below budget by 22 cases. Cardiac surgery procedures were below budget by five. Neurosurgical procedures were above budget by six. Joint replacement surgeries were above budget by 12. In the cath lab, uh, procedures for February uh, numbered 359, and that was 43 cases above the budget, and 72 more than February a year ago. Inpatient cath lab procedures were above budget by 38. Outpatient cath lab procedures were above budget by five. Our cardiac procedures in the cath lab were above budget by two. Non-vascular interventional radiology procedures were above budget by five. Neurointerventional radiology procedures were above budget by six. Peripheral vascular procedures were above budget by 30. So once again, they are driving cath lab volume. In terms of deliveries for February, we had 113. We came in below budget by 35. Um, our non-ER outpatient trends, um, we had non-emergency outpatient visits totaling 7,212. They came in above budget by 341. That's a 5% positive variance. Our respiratory therapy visits were above budget by 41. Outpatient wound visits were above budget by 47. Um, prenatal diagnostic center visits were above budget by 54. Rehab visits were above budget by 54. Infusion visits were above budget by 76. Cardiac rehab visits were above budget by 88. Our emergency room visits of 4,221 were below budget by 328. 
but above the same period last year by 46 visits. Our productivity indicators, um, our productive FTEs were below budget by 53.6. Um, that's a 3.7% variance. Non-productive FTEs were below budget by 13.1. Total FTEs of 1,564.3 were below budget by 66.7. Total productive FG, FTEs per adjusted occupied bed of 4.95 were below the budget of 5.73. Total FTEs per adjusted occupied bed of 5.56 were below the budget of 6.46. Other operational statistics, the Outpatient Surgery Center had 418 cases in February. This was 44 below the budget, um, but five more cases than the same time last year. Clinic visits of 3,370 were below budget by 261 for the month. Um, Washington Urgent Care was down by 25, Nakamura by 80. Newer Clinic by 86, Warm Springs by 50, and Ohlone by 20. Uh, our payer mixes. The preliminary information for the month of, of February is unfavorable. Uh, government sponsored patient revenue made up 74.6% of total gross revenue. We had budgeted 72.1. We're getting to the three-quarter mark on that. HMO revenue was 2% of gross revenue, which was below a budget of 2.9%. PPO revenue was 20.8% of gross revenue, which was below the budget of 22.7%. Private pay revenue was 2.6% of gross revenue, um, which came in above 2.3, which we had budgeted. Days cash on hand for February ended up at 145 days, one day, uh, up one day from last month. Um, days of gross revenue and accounts receivable were 54, which is a very good number. And there was $741,346 in charity care applications pending or approved in February. You can see the number is mounting. We're heading back up to where we were. Four. Now, one of the other things that I wanted to tell the board about in terms of our operations this month was the effects of the Senate Bill 1152. And in February, we had 191 homeless patient encounters. Um, patients that had more than one encounter numbered 23. Um, the incremental cost that's estimated, and this is an estimate, um, is 57224 um, The estimated unreimbursed cost of homeless care was $691,472. So the estimated unreimbursed cost of homeless care calendar year to date for 2019 from the inception of this new law is $1,295,402. The incremental costs speak to um, food, clothing, pharmaceuticals, transportation, housing, um, labor, and avoidable inpatient days. 86% um, of these patients were seen in the emergency room. 11% were inpatients. 3% were in observation. Um, just wanted to keep you abreast of where this is all going. It is definitely <clears throat> yet a new ball game with uncompensated care. Have you Nancy? thought about uh, a line item on the uh, you know how we uh, depict the charity care and bad debt on the income statement? You, you, as large as it, this is getting, you might want to think about Chris to it's going to be big yeah absolutely big we're at a point now where we need to uh, address our action items 
As uh, I indicated early on, we have received a letter of resignation from Pat Danielson, which uh, creates a vacancy on the board. I'd like, first of all, to, uh, to read that letter of resignation. I'll get to it eventually, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Somewhere it's in here. I thought I had that. It's, it's here. I'm sorry. It's coming to you. Okay. There it is. I have, an, I have two now. I'm sorry and I apologize. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Uh, to the Board of Directors, to Nancy Farber, the Chief, Chief Executive Officer. Dear colleagues and friends, it is with great sadness that I tender my resignation from the Board of Directors of the Washington Township Healthcare District, effective March 13th, 2019. Although I, I had hoped my health would improve sufficiently to allow me to resume my duties as a board member, I have now determined that my resignation would be best for the district and for me. The district deserves to have an active board, me active board members who are capable of fulfilling their duties to the district. This I can no longer do. Although my decision to resign is a difficult and painful one, I am comforted with the thought that I leave the district in good and capable hands. I extend my heartfelt and personal appreciation to each of you. You have been a joy to work with and together we have accomplished so much for the district's residents. The district is financially sound and remains a critical, pub a critical publicly owned community asset and resource. The new and extraordinary Morris Hyman Pavilion enhances the district's ability to provide quality health care to our community now and into the future. I am grateful that I was able to be part of making all of this happen. Last but certainly not least, I wish to thank the voters of the district who gave me the chance to serve the district that I love so much. The trust you bestowed in me will remain a highlight of my life. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, sincerely and with appreciation, Pat. That's a very difficult letter for me to read. Uh, I've enjoyed working with Pat for uh, 16 years. Uh, she has served on, on the board for uh, more than 18 years. And uh, over that period of time, I, I have to say that uh, she has been an example to me of what a public servant ought to be. Uh, she has done so much at so many areas and so beyond even the board responsibilities. Uh, I, I recently saw a list of her uh, uh, volunteer work over the last uh, number of years and it, uh, it's about two pages typewritten. Uh, everything from graffiti abatement to uh, serving uh, as uh, chairman of the uh, employment uh, uh, group at uh, Newark Days and treasurer of that organization for over 20 years. Remarkable achievements that, uh, that she's done over a very, very long period of time. She has attended many, many events throughout the city, Tri-City area, supporting groups here and there, representing the hospital. Uh, she felt it a very, very important thing to, uh, to, to present a, a positive, uplifting uh, vision of the hospital and our service to the communities. Uh, she's done a remarkable, remarkable job in all that. Up until her illness, uh, 
<laughs> Honestly, I can't remember her missing a board meeting. Uh, some of us have missed board meetings, uh, but Pat, I think, was always here. Uh, I just wanted to spend just a, a, just a short minute explaining one part of her life that uh, maybe not too many people are aware of, maybe more than, more than I think. Every year, the hospital has a, a golf tournament. And uh, as board, as members of the board of directors, uh, you know, it, it's kind of expected that we golf. There's only one small problem with that, <laughs> and that and that is there's only one golfer among us, and and, that, and that's Mike Wallace. Uh, the other three, four of us, are very fortunate to know what end of a golf club to pick up, and. Uh, Pat, though, invented a way for us to participate in the, in the uh, golf tournament and to even make a little bit of money in the process for the district and for district, district uh, needs. And that has to do with a small duck. Uh, and it's called Whack-A-Duck. And uh, this is Pat's invention. And uh, the uh, it's a game that we play out on the golf course with the golfers as they come through to to uh, to play and uh, you try and with a golf club hit this little duck uh, into uh, into a pool and uh, if you succeed in doing that you you you're rewarded and uh, all manner of things. It's quite a little game, and it's fun for most people. Uh, and uh, we've discovered that it's best to hit the duck from the back. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, a lot of fun with Pat. A lot of nice things happen with with her, and uh, uh, I, I I will be very very sorry to uh, to see her leave the board. She's been an asset to the district an asset to all the all the citizens of the district a very very wonderful wonderful person to work with uh, I'd invite any other board members that uh, would like to comment on that before we move forward yeah mr. president first of all I'd like to uh, say that uh, no real ducks were harmed in the wack duck program so just uh, the folks at PETA can can uh, go easy um, I, too, Mr. President, share uh, your sadness in receiving this letter. Uh, having served with Pat for 18 years, uh, it's been an honor, a privilege, and most of all, a pleasure serving with Pat. Uh, the things that I most valued about her service on the board was, number one, her connectedness with the community. She had a keen political insight. She knew what was going on in the community, and she reflected that well in her comments and contribution to the board. I also enjoyed her great sense of humor. Um, probably the most important thing about Pat is that uh, she reflected the values of this institution in that we're here to serve that community and she reflected that by being uh, so attuned to that community uh, she had a very good and strong moral compass in all the decisions that we make here on the board and use the patient first ethic as, as a true guiding light in making those decisions where the patient and the community come first and that's really what our mission is um, in her letter there she talked about uh, her appreciating the support of the voters I can understand that uh, I had the uh, opportunity to share several election cycles with Pat she and I uh, were on the ballot several times over those 18 years um, and those were always anxious times for for Pat um, the one thing I can say in in those uh, 
sometimes sharply contested elections, is that uh, I never felt that Pat and I were running against each other. We were running with each other. And that was the thing I really enjoyed about Pat, is, is she shared the love and the mission of this, of this hospital. Um, she'll be sorely missed on this board. Her contributions were great. And Pat, if you're listening, we'll miss you a lot, a whole lot. I knew Pat actually even before coming into this uh, board. We have been in the board together for 14 years. Uh, about 20 years ago, I think, uh, we served in the Public Health Commission of uh, Alameda County, and that's where I met Pat first. And since then, uh, you know, since he's from Newark, and uh, I work at Newark, uh, we have had a lot of common grounds to share at Newark. And like everyone else said, I think uh, Pat was definitely a definition of what a volunteer is. Uh, she was ready to volunteer for anything and all the time. And she really b believed in health. And I think uh, there was a sticker at the back of the car which said, health matters. And that really mattered to her. And, um, you know, she was uh, actually a political mentor to me. She was a friend of mine and a colleague of mine on this board. Uh, I think it was Muhammad Ali who said, when you serve, you're paying the rent for your time on this planet. And I think Pat has paid her rent very well. Uh, she'll definitely be missed, my friend, my colleague. Well, I, uh, it's, it is truly a, a sad day. I, I think I've served on the board uh, the longest period of time with Pat, and, uh, and certainly it was a privilege. Uh, I think uh, nearly a thousand meetings, and I don't know how many other encounters uh, that we've had. And as uh, Dr. Nicholson uh, has pointed out, I, I really enjoyed her wit, and um, I'm sorry that we won't have the, the uh, opportunity on the, at least in uh, certain times to, uh, to share a laugh together. Um, but beyond the, uh, the, the wonderful things that has already been said about her participation in the community, she was very um, knowledgeable in health matters, and having a background in the uh, uh, coding of different um, diseases and uh, her, her uh, participation was always um, uh, 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 enlightening to me, particularly since I am not in the in the medical community uh, for a living. Um, I, uh, I certainly will miss her. Uh, she was a great face uh, for the board in the community, very active and very caring person, and I, I just wish her all the best in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, members. Nancy, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Mm -hmm. The board has spoken very eloquently to her contributions. On a personal basis, I'll miss her sense of humor. We've lost our Mrs. Santa Claus. That was something she loved to do and did every year for all of the breakfasts with Ronald McDonald and at other occasions. She had a gentle soul. Uh, I think she was known for her love of animals. She was particularly fond uh, of turtles and birds and kept them as companions in her home for many years. There's a very human side to Pat. And she cared about young men and women who were coming up in their field and that they be given opportunities to experience um, exposure to the professions here at, at the hospital and was a strong advocate for them. She didn't just care about Newark, the community that she lived in. She cared about all of the Tri-Cities and you know, much to my amazement, go to something like the Mutt Strut, 
which is a fundraiser for the um, Union City School District. And as many people knew her in that crowd as knew her in Newark. She was universally recognized as a person who cared about the community, all of us. It's been a privilege to serve as the CEO with Pat on our board, and it's been a privilege to call her my friend. I will miss her dearly. So, we're faced with a, a vacancy on the board. And uh, historically, when a vacancy has occurred, the board has not called for an election, but preferred to fill the vacancy by appointment. Given that an election would cost uh, tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, and do all manner of problems to Chris's financial outlooks, money, that money could certainly be spent better providing patient care. So I think we should proceed with an, an appointment rather than an election. No doubt prior boards felt the same way. However, if any board member here uh, wants to discuss calling for a special election, uh, uh, please let me know and we can have that discussion. Is there any sentiment for that among the board at all? Uh, that's, that's fine. Um, we have a draft resolution and a process for filing the vacancy by appointment uh, and we'll we'll take that up now and uh, list the key points and in, in how that would be accomplished so today we're announcing that there is a vacancy on the board of directors and that our intention is to fill that vacancy by appointment uh, qualified applicants uh, the the basic qualification would be a person who resides in the district. That's the Tri-City area with uh, parts of Sunol and the southern part of Hayward. Uh, they would, those qualified applicants would need to submit an application, resume, and letter of interest and a conflicts questionnaire by 5 p.m. on May 20, I'm sorry, March 27th. Uh, all of those documents could be can be obtained on the hospital website or from the district clerk. Uh, the district clerk is D. Antonio, who sits with us here tonight. Uh, her office is in the administrative area of the of the main hospital. Uh, at the April 10th, 2019 board. Uh, board, I'm sorry, at the April 10th, 2019, the board will consider the applications. At that meeting, we will discuss the applicants and possibly move to fill the vacancy by appointment if an applicant has the support of the majority of the board. Alternatively, the board may decide to interview one or more of the applicants, in which case the board will schedule a future meeting to do so, following which the board will make an appointment. The board at this point has until May 12th to either make an appointment or call for an election. So that's the process that we're, we're headed into. Before we proceed, uh, does any board member have a any comments on that? If not, then I'd open the, I would now open the public hearing on that to hear from comments from the public. Are there any comments tonight that we need to hear from? Uh, seeing none, the public hearing is closed and now it's up to the board to take action. Uh, does anyone on the board have any further comments before we take action on this item? Apparently not. We're good. Then uh, I'd ask uh, Dr. Epen to present that action item.
Mr. President, I move for adoption of Resolution 1194, which is a resolution of the Board of Directors of Washington Township Healthcare District, declaring a vacancy and approving an appointment process to fill the vacancy. Second. The motion and a second. Any further discussion at all? And Dean, if you'd take the roll. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. That motion passes. Uh, we're ready now to take on the, the easier resolutions tonight. Uh, Dr. Epen, uh, item C. B. I'm sorry, D. Mr. President, I move for adoption of resolution number 1195, which is a resolution of the Board of Directors of Washington Township Healthcare District, approving an amendment to the Washington Township Hospital Service League incorporated by laws. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on that item? I, I just would explain. Um, or Ruth, perhaps you want to. So, what the changes were in the bylaws, there were several. There were multiple types of membership there was the active, inactive, associate, and a lifetime member. And so, after looking at this, and looking at the numbers of who was left in the various categories, I think we had maybe three inactive members, and their dues was $3. And the associate members were people who just wanted to be notified. They move out of the area, and they just want to have notification when something happens with the service league. And so their dues was $30. And then we had active members whose dues is $10. And the gotcha one was the lifetime membership, which was $100. So we've looked at this, and we're looking at a way to kind of stabilize our, our budgetary constraints also with, with, within the service league. Looked at the lifetime membership, and the regular members were paying $10 a year. So if you're here for $10 and you never became a lifetime member, you paid $130. And a lifetime member has paid $100. So we tried to even out the playing board. And anyone that is currently a lifetime member, of which there are eight, will remain lifetime members. Anyone new, we would no longer offer the option for lifetime membership. And each year, they would just pay their annual dues. And on the inactive member, we decided that you're either active or an associate. And that you would, the $3 membership is kind of just gone away uh, that we would no longer offer the inactive because we were sending them out mailers we were sending out various different type of communications and so you would either be an active or an associate so we did keep the associate at thirty dollars and the active went up to ten to twenty dollars a year as opposed to ten thank you ruth thank you i think we're ready to take a vote on that d Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. <laughs> Item E. C. Mr. President, in accordance with the district law policies and procedures, I move the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer to execute the appropriate contract documents to complete the purchase of 11 Interly Bridge modules to interface with respirators for total amount not to exceed $29,500. Nancy? This is equipment that was included in the fixed asset budget. Just and what it does is interface budget. respirators used in critical the care the next one will be. with the Philips physiological monitor so that all the clinical information is displayed on one monitoring system and that in turn this data is transferred seamlessly to the medical record. Um, this is a major safety improvement for patient care and a reduction in data entry work for the clinical staff. Good. Any other discussion on that? Uh, Dee, if you'd take the roll. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Good. That motion passes. Uh, I misspoke earlier, and uh, we'll, we'll now take up item E. What we just passed was item D, mm -hmm. and I, I apologize for that. So, Dr. Epen, if you'd help us. The actual item E. 
Mr. President, in accordance with the district law policies and procedures, I move that the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer to enter into the necessary contracts to proceed with the purchase of copier replacement hardware for a total amount not to exceed $48,299.43. I'm sorry, are, are we totally confused on no, this? No, we're good. No, we're okay. <laughs> we're second. That is that. All right. <laughs> okay. okay. Nancy, if you'd like to tell us about copiers. Um, yeah, we use Jeez. copiers all over the hospital, even though we have electronic records. Um, you'd think they would have gone away, but they haven't. Um, every year, our IT department reviews the call history, um, service call history, and the page counts and technology usage for these copiers. And we replace them at regular intervals. And this year, we've identified seven copiers that need to be replaced. Um, they will be copiers in the nursing areas, pharmacy, and admitting. Um, these were included in our budget. Further discussion? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dee, if you'd take the roll. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Here we go. Now we're ready for F. <laughs> Somehow I'll, I'll learn how to use the alphabet. Item <laughs> F. Yeah. It's never too late. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Oh dear. Mr. President, in accordance with the district law policies and procedures, I move that the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer to enter into necessary contracts and proceed with the purchase of hardware, software, and implementation services for the security event information management system for a total amount not to exceed $182,600. Second. Any discussion on that, Nancy? Yes, that included in our fixed asset capital budget. Um, this is an information services security system that um, uses a complex set of technology solutions which combine to form the overall data security solution for the district. And the deployment of a security information and event management system will provide a unified view into our infrastructure, but also provide workflow compliance and log management. This was called out as a specific and key recommendation in the final re report of our external cybersecurity maturity assessment that was performed this past year. And they specifically recommended that we do this, and I would encourage the board to take affirmative action on this. All very, very concerned about the security. security. Yeah. D, if you'd take the role. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Ethan? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Item G. Mr. President, in accordance with the district law policies and procedures, I move that the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer to enter into necessary contracts and proceed with the purchase of the hardware, software, and implementation services for the Itachi Ventara video management platform for the total amount not to exceed $266,976. Second. So we have a motion and a second on that item. Uh, Nancy? Um, the current video management system, and this is a different kind of security. We're not talking about IT anymore. We're talking about physical security. Um, the current video management platform enables hundreds of cameras that, that are located across our campus to record and to be viewed by security personnel in a central location. Um, this, this system is in need of upgrade um, that will enable longer video retention and more reliable infrastructure and better performance. This system um, will be located um, in our new Morris Hyman data center, and the platform will be man managed by information services data administrators who currently manage similar server and storage solutions for our electronic medical record system. Um, 
I think that this is a, a necessary part of managing our campus. Good. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. And D, if you'll take the roll. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Nicholson. Aye. Director Epen. Aye. Director Wallace. Aye. That motion passes. Our last action item, item H. Mr. President, in accordance with the district law policies and procedures, I move that the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer to execute the, the appropriate contract documents to complete the purchase of the new digital security cameras in an amount not to exceed $54,625. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, Nancy. Um, you'd be interested to know that we have 21 analog cameras still in service. They range in age from 14 to 20 years of age. I would say that we got our use out of them. <laughs> um, we need to replace them. And this is something that's in our fixed asset budget. It's time. Anyone <laughs> familiar with the digital age is uh, horrified by 20 years old. <laughs> <laughs> 20 year old. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, any further discussion on that? Good. D, if you'd take the roll. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Nicholson. Aye. Director Eben. Aye. Director Wallace. Aye. That, was, that motion passes. We're at, a po we're at a point now where we will adjourn to a closed session. We appreciate everyone's attendance here tonight. Thank you. At this point, we'll reconvene to an open session and announce that no reportable action was taken during the closed session. There being no further business this evening, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.